This podcast may contain content that is graphic and disturbing in nature. Listener discretion is advised. From dating to home buying, many people nowadays turn to strangers on the internet to solve some of their biggest life problems. But as this woman found out, you cannot always trust someone that you met online. This is the Wendy Ween story. Megan. Hey, Amy. How's it going? I'm sort of curious by your introduction to this case where you're going. Yeah, this case is definitely a bit lighter than the usual stuff we cover. And I wasn't even sure if I was going to do it. But I don't know about you, but sometimes I need a break from stories about people being victimized, be it at the hands of another person or just the system at large. That's very true. I mean, we deal with this a lot and... You know. And I suggest you do it because it was really it was a nice reprieve. I mean, although not as heavy, though, there are things to be learned from this story and we will still discuss theories at the end. OK, this is a very special episode. As of this episode, we will be weekly. So listeners will be getting double the amount of episodes every month now. I hope they're as excited as we are right now because I'm beyond. And we really owe it to all of our supporters, because if it was not for all of our listeners, we would not be going weekly. So thank you all so much. Uh, Seriously, a big thanks. And so our first weekly case, we're starting that. And we have one other announcement right now. Right, Amy? We also have our next Zoom happy hour for our patrons. And that will be on June 5th at 7 p.m. So that's a Sunday, 7 p.m. Eastern time, right? Yes, it'll be June 5th, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Also hoping uh, by then, I think we'll have a verdict in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial, which so many people were interested in. So I think we're going to have some definite discussion points on that one as well. Okay, before we jump into today's episode, we have some supporters that we would like to acknowledge. All right, we have Anthony Rubano from his mom, Andrea, and sister, Cat with Love. He was really reluctant to listen with us initially, but now he adores the show. Isn't that cool? That's really cool. Thank you to the whole family for listening. Thank you. <laughs> we have Michelle B., who's listening from Vancouver, Canada. We have Sarah Wren, and we have Nagar, which is the Persian name for sweetheart. Did you know that, Amy? No. What a beautiful name. We also have Lisa, Samantha Price, and who else, Amy? Alex Johnson, Deanna, Adriana, who is also a John Jay alumni. And we have three new listeners from Australia. How awesome is that? So we have Cass, we have Matt from Melbourne, and we have Sarah Prassy from Sydney. Megan, you're going to be covering an Australian case soon, aren't you? I am. I have a couple on my list. Uh, It's actually a question from one of our supporters, so I'll answer it then. But I do have a few. Other than becoming a patron, there are many ways that you can support us. So you can follow us wherever you listen to your podcast. And that way you'll get notified when we release a new episode. You can leave us a review or you could follow us on social media and share our episodes with a friend. As promised, today's episode will be a bit lighter than normal, so I hope our listeners appreciate the break. And let's get into the Wendy Ween story. Megan, do you know much about contract killing, like Hitman? Um, no, not really. I mean, I get the cons. Only what I learned from um, the movie Horrible Bosses. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It was very interesting because I don't know much about the topic, but while researching this case, I really saw how little research is out there. It's not exactly a group that's willing to talk with, you know, researchers. Yeah, that's true. I mean, what I probably my knowledge that I have probably comes from the interviews I've seen with Richard Kuklinski. I was just going to say the Iceman. Iceman. And we just watched uh, a documentary uh, the other night. I don't know if James watched it with me. Oh, I watched it with my mom. (laughs) We watched a documentary, Sammy the Bull Gravano. Mm -hmm. And remember, he was the hitman for John Gotti. And so he did a lot of interviews as well. Yeah. In fact, one of the papers I found by James A. Black even says, quote, Almost all available information about murder for hire is anecdotal and non-scientific. I guess this case involves a possible hitman, huh? Yeah. So as you mentioned, when we think of Hitman, we think of this movie idea, right, about a flawless professional, probably works for the mafia. But that's not how these things work in real life. No. Now, I found a couple of studies that analyzed known cases where contract killers were involved. 
So I want to share a few facts with you before we get into today's case. But as social scientists, we know this. You need to take what we're saying with a grain of salt because most of these studies had very small sample sizes because well, right. this is a small area. I'm glad to know. I mean, if they had huge sample sizes, it would mean there were more hitmen than we, we you know, would hope. That's a good point. So victims of contract killers are more often men than women. That makes sense to me. Yeah, so 68% men, 32% women. Mm -hmm. However, this is the interesting part. Although the victims are more often men, just as many women hire contract killers as do men, 47 versus 53%. Oh, okay. And I wasn't surprised to learn this, but the motive in almost half of contracts to kill was what? Financial or revenge? Financial. So okay. most were financial, 21% personal, 11% business, which is also kind of financial, mm -hmm. right? One British study in 2014 found that the average price promised to a contract killer was around $5,000. I bet people think it's like, you know, 100000 or 50000 but I suspected the number was much lower. Yeah. And so as you could imagine, at that price, hitmen are not always experienced professionals, right? Right. Many are novices or part-time criminals that might dabble in illegal activity. Again, it's not what we see in shows and movies. Well, I still think about Jamie Foxx and Horrible Bosses. Do you, not, do you remember that? He was the hitman called, I think his name was Motherfucker. <laughs> no. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that was his name. And, you know, they thought he was like this, like, you know, hitman. He was, he was like, basically knew nothing about it. Yeah. I mean, you would expect you would need to be paid pretty well to take that kind of chance to kill for someone else, right? I would think so, but it's relative. Yeah, true. I mean, and sometimes you have people who are closely related who are, or who are promised other things such as sexual favors or any other incentive. Mm-hmm. In the study I referenced earlier, 44% of the killers contracted were strangers, 32% acquaintances, 15% were intimate partners, and 4% were another family member. Okay. Almost half of the people trusted strangers. Right. Which is interesting. Well, Would you ever trust a stranger to... Uh, well, I'm not ever going to hire a hitman, but I <laughs> will also say... Uh, unless you know of a family member who's willing to help you. I mean, are you surrounded by people you think would act as a hitman? No. I mean, most people who are paying to have someone killed are new to that area. And so where do they actually go to find a contract killer? Oh, God. Are you, that's why this ties in. They go online? Well, that brings us to the case of Wendy Ween. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So we know very little about Wendy. And it could be because this is such a recent case. So maybe we'll learn more about her as time goes on. But what we do know is that in the summer of 2020, Wendy was a 51-year-old resident of Monroe County. So that's in southeastern Michigan, kind of between Detroit and Toledo, Ohio, just to give you orientation. Okay. So on July 17th of 2020, Wendy was searching online for a way to take care of a problem she was having. Oh, God. When she came across a website rentahitman.com, which promised to, quote, handle your delicate situation privately and in a timely manner with its almost 18,000 field operatives who can do a job anywhere in the United States. Wait a second. First of all, <laughs> how can a website uh, pledge to provide you with criminalized behavior? Oh, Megan, we will get there. But before okay. we get there, let me walk you through this a little more. Okay. When you go to the homepage, it says, got issues? Click here. And there's a service request form that you can click on. And that's exactly what Wendy did. She filled out a form on the site seeking consultation for her issue. Her issue, which turned out to be her ex-husband, who was living in Tennessee at the time. Now, his name was not made public. I don't know anything about him. All I know is that she did accuse him of being a pedophile in one article that I read. Okay. So I just want to read you a little bit from this service request form. Of course, you need your birthday, your email address, typical things, right? Your address for field operative use only. Okay. Oh, my God. And then enter your desired safe word or phrase. Are you making this up? Example, leave the gun, take the cannoli. Oh, my God. Relation to intended target. Spouse, business partner, bully, government official, politician, nanny, target's name, target's phone number, address where service is requested, describe what you would like performed. Um, you can upload a picture. It does say, though, no cat pictures, please. What? Okay. So CNN got a copy of Wendy's initial communication, and part of it read, quote, this is kind of weird that your company is not on the deep or dark web. I prefer not going to jail. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Sorry. So, <laughs> yeah. so the inquiry went to a man she believes was the site's chief consultant by the name of Guido Finelli. 
Wendy got an email back that said, are you still interested and would you like to be connected to one of our many field operatives, also known as a hitman? And Wendy answered yes and yes. Okay. However, you might suspect it would turn out that Guido Finelli was not a hitman. He was actually a man by the name of Bob Innes. In fact, he was just the opposite. Instead of helping out Wendy, Bob turned over Wendy's information to the Michigan State Police. And what followed was what we known as really what we could say was an undercover sting operation. But who was he? Just like a concerned citizen? <laughs> I know you're dying to know. You have okay. To stick with All right. So at this point, things were out of Bob's hands. But Wendy believed that she would be meeting Guido to discuss the hit and to give him a down payment when, in fact, she was going to meet a plainclothes state trooper. Mm. So Wendy meets a plainclothes officer in a parking lot just south of Detroit in a town called South Rockwood. Now, during this encounter, Wendy offered to pay the man $5,000 mm -hmm. to kill her ex-husband, and she also gave him a $200 down payment. In addition, she provided his home address, his place of work, and his daily schedule. Now, she was clearly ready to move forward, and she showed serious intent. So is this not entrapment, or is that only when it's directly <laughs> on behalf of police officers? I mean, okay, because, so yeah, I'm confused. <laughs> I have a whole discussion for you about entrapment and solicitation. So I know you're on the edge of your seat and you Literally. want to talk this stuff, but you're going to have to hold on that also. <sighs> All right. So Wendy was arrested. OK. Not surprisingly. But before we talk further about Wendy and what happened after this meeting and her arrest, let's talk about Bob Innes. OK, good. So at the time of this event, Bob was 54 years old and living in Northern California. Now, 15 years prior in 2005, Bob was a business school student in North Carolina. Okay. Now, he was trying to launch an internet security business with some friends that actually started as a class project. Now, the plan was to focus on web traffic and risk analysis for small networks and businesses. Okay. So, the site rentahitman.com was developed at this time. The site's name was what you could say was kind of tongue-in-cheek, as Bob described in a CNN article. He says rent as in hire us, Hitman as in website traffic and analytics. Oh. So he says, you know, visits to websites are sometimes called hits. I get it. I get it. OK. Sorry. So it was essentially a play on words. Got it. Unfortunately for Bob and his friends, the business never really took off. And Bob's career went in a different direction. Let's fast forward a little. You know, he left the site dormant. He moved on with his life. He actually tried to sell the domain name, but he did not have any luck. I can't imagine why. I can't either. <laughs> so... He forgot about it, he says, until 2008 when he decided he wanted to check the site's inbox just for fun. He saw a few requests. He didn't think much of it. But then a few years later, he checked again and he saw an email that struck him as serious. Now, it was an inquiry from a woman who was a British citizen living in Ontario, Canada. And she wrote to the website on that form mm -hmm. saying she needed three people to be killed. She also provided information such as addresses. So this is when things changed for Bob. I'm assuming it was first out of curiosity that he started looking up the addresses. And once he saw that it actually matched the information he was provided, he realized this wasn't a joke. Because how could one assume anything but when you look at that right. website? It's right. got to be a joke, right? Luckily, Bob alerted authorities before anyone was hurt because who knows what this woman was capable of. The woman ended up being arrested because it turned out she had some warrants out for her arrest. And she did spend a short time behind bars and then she was deported back to Britain. So Bob explains in this article in CNN, he says, you know, this was my first case. This $9.20 website just prevented three murders. Wow. OK, I get it. So this is when things get even more fun. Bob put some more time into the site at this point because he wanted to make it more obvious that it was a parody, which I think it was pretty obvious before. OK. But some things were added. So if you don't mind bearing with me for a moment, Megan. All righty. So he on his homepage, he says, Rent a Hitman is safe, secure, and available right here on the World Wide Web. Our client's confidentiality is important to us, so rest assured that your information will remain private as required under the HIPAA, the Hitman Information Privacy and Protection Act. Okay. Okay, so it says that. So in case anyone is wondering, HIPAA is... <laughs> Doesn't exist. <laughs> well, HIPAA exists, but it is obviously health insurance, healthcare. Yeah. healthcare. I can't believe anyone like thinks this is legit. All of our competitors' websites cannot say that, and shouldn't we be trusted? The dark web is not safe, but we are. <laughs> this um, is too much. 
Another part, I mean, I could spend hours on this website. I'm just going to, two more things that I love. Due to contractual restrictions, Rent the Hitman is no longer affiliated with Diners Club, the Detroit Lions, <laughs> Kanye West, <laughs> the Illuminati, <laughs> Donald Trump, oh my God. Rudolph Giuliani, Alec Baldwin, <laughs> Kyle Rittenhouse, or Carol Baskin. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so clearly this is a satirical website, but in case you weren't convinced, there are some testimonials from customers who are satisfied. Oh, okay. um, Phil M. from Florida says Guido and his public relations crew were able to resolve a five-year dispute in a matter of days. Highly recommended. Oh, my God. Laura S. from Arizona caught my husband cheating with the babysitter, and our relationship was terminated after a free public relations consultation. I'm single again and looking to mingle. Thanks, Guido. This is too much. Okay. This reminds me of like the review game. It's, yes, it's just- Five stars, you know, this place was- There's also group and senior discounts available. You're kidding. No, and there's stock photos. Let me just show you this stock photo under group discounts. <laughs> Ah, that's so terrible. Yes. So there's a stock photo that shows, you know, one guy, they're all wearing like business casual clothes. There's one guy who's like pouty with his three coworkers behind him, <laughs> like scheming about something. So, I mean, they, um, they also won some industry awards, um, 2021 Best in Class from the International Association of Retired Hitman. I was going to ask what the association was. <laughs> and also, Megan, they recruit for field operatives. Oh, Okay. Quote, so your high school's guidance counselor, your parents, and the lady down the street told you you would never amount to much of anything? It's time to prove them all wrong and become the individual you always knew you could be, a field operative with the best problem resolution organization in the world. This is too much. Where did you hear about this case? Okay. So this case I heard about when I was just doing some research. I kind of wanted to do something a little different, and I realized we never covered a hitman situation. So I was looking at Dahlia DePolito. What's oh, her name? Oh, yeah, is Dahlia that... DiPolito, yeah. And her case is unbelievable. And then I looked, and we don't like to do things that are overly covered. Oh, yeah, her case so has her been case covered. So her case was, it's super interesting, but it was overly covered. So then I just started looking around for other murder for hire cases that included women. And then I fell down a really, really large rabbit hole. Okay. Um. So Bob says most of the messages he get are not serious, but about 10% actually get forwarded to the police. And even a smaller percent, of course, check out as serious. But he says he saved over like a dozen people's lives. I and can believe it. Yeah. I don't know how he came up with that number, but even saving one person's life, I think it's, you know, worthwhile. As Bob was quoted saying in one of his interviews, quote, I run a spreadsheet of the requests that I've received. About 350 requests are on that spreadsheet. Not all of them are murder for hire. Some of them are for people looking for assisted suicide options. Some of them are clearly hoaxes where they're trying to prank their friends. Some of them are for people that are seeking employment, which I clearly cannot help them with. And out of the 350, about 10% are for those people that are seeking to cause harm to others. Now, of those, I ask the same two questions I always do. Do you still require our services? And would you like me to place you in contact with a field operative? If I never hear back from them, maybe they have figured it out. Maybe they get a free pass on this one. But if they respond back with yes, okay, I'll put you in contact with the field operatives. I'll be your matchmaker. And do you remember at the beginning I said 18,000 field operatives? Yes. What is 18, about 18,000 police departments exactly. in the United States? <laughs> How great is that? And I think he was even more specific. His number was like 17,000 something, but it matches up with the number of uh, 17,985. Yep. Which matches up with local jurisdictions that yep. we know. So I thought that was pretty brilliant. I think that's smart too. There was one other case of note before we get back to Wendy. And this was a mentally disabled man from Virginia who tried to hire someone to kill his ex-girlfriend and her parents in 2018, also using the website. He also wanted to kidnap her baby. Oh my God. Luckily, he was sentenced in 2019 to 10 years in prison for solicitation to commit first degree murder. Wow. So, I mean- Bob's getting stuff done here. He sure is. So then this brings us to the next big case, which is Wendy's. In November of 2021, Wendy pled guilty to one count each of solicitation of murder and illegal use of a computer to facilitate a crime. Now, the sentencing hearing was held quite recently, January 18th, 2022. And during the sentencing hearing, a remorseful Wendy addressed the court and she took full accountability mm -hmm. in the botched murder for hire plot. She said, quote, I take full responsibility for my actions and I hope a lesson is learned by my example. I have no right to lash out at anyone. And in a matter of minutes, I changed everyone's life. 
I've come from a small town where everyone knows everyone. I've humiliated my family doing this. I am not making excuses for myself. I simply wanted to let you know where my head was. The judge remarked that, quote, if the intent was not so serious here, this would almost be comical. Mm -hmm. But it's not. Nobody looking at it could have believed that this website was real. But you did. And this didn't just pop up on your Facebook feed. You went looking for it. Mm. Did she ever state on the record? Uh, is there, do we know why she wanted to kill her ex-husband? There was that one um, article in the New York Post that she said he was a pedophile. And it was an ex. That's that's the only thing. She's, okay. I don't think she's ever really said more. Okay. I didn't know if she discussed yeah. it in her statement. No, but as I said, this is so new. I'm I'm sure people will take an interest in her story and ask her for interviews. And Well, I'm sure they will after they hear this. I mean. <laughs> yeah. So Wendy was ultimately sentenced to seven to 20 years to be served in a state prison. Okay. And of course was credited with having already served 545 days of her sentence. So for now, that's really the end of Wendy's story. But we're not done here, Megan. I had a feeling, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on with the website? So despite the publicity that cases like Wendy's bring to the website, Bob says he still gets online requests from people who want to hire a hitman. And some even reach out from overseas asking if he can arrange a hit in a specific country. And you know what's interesting to note? He doesn't advertise the website. You know, people only find this if they're looking. Obviously, people like me find it when I hear about it like this. So I think it's different now Like now that he's done interviews and it's been made more public. But when you look back like a couple of years, people looking for this are not looking for good things. Maybe that's how you actually heard about this case. <laughs> 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 so now he said he's pivoting a little and he's trying to educate people about the online dangers and calling for tougher laws for people convicted of using the Internet to carry out violent crimes. Mm -hmm. He says, quote, this is a work in progress. But if there are any lawmakers, Internet safety groups or anyone else that may want to assist in this project, that would be greatly appreciated. Now, do you know where I heard an awesome interview with him? No. So once I started into this case, I, I try to look at everything I can. Oh, I know how you <laughs> I go I, crazy. I know. So I looked at every podcast that mm. he was on and listened to most of them. And our buddies at Crawl Space have a two-parter. Get interviewing out. Interviewing him. Yes. Tim and Lance interviewed him? Tim and Lance interviewed Bob Innes. Um, so as Bob told them, he runs the site completely out of pocket, although he says he does accept donations to cover the costs associated with running the website. And- you could see on the website, he actually sells merch and he, there's a PayPal button. What kind of merch does he sell? Are they supposed to be like funny t-shirts? I'm just curious. If you want to, you could buy a field operative 100% HIPAA compliant t-shirt, which is $25. You know, it's not meant to be serious. I can't believe people think this is real. Yeah. And then if you want to support him, Guido's Coffee Fund for just $5, you'll get a very caffeinated Guido. And you could take satisfaction knowing that Guido and the site will remain fully caffeinated. Okay. Um, you know, there's all these different silly things. But as Bob explains, the site is not a ploy to lure people or to dupe people who want to have others killed. These people search the internet to contact a hitman. Mm -hmm. He thinks he's actually saving lives because people that are looking for a real hitman get to him. And if they found mm -hmm. a real hitman, then things would not turn out so great. So obviously a big area of discussion here, as we hinted at before. Entrapment. Yes. So law enforcement as undercover cops were actually involved in 35% of contract killing cases, according to the research done by Black that we talked about in the introduction. Okay. So is this entrapment? It sounds like entrapment to me, but I don't know because it's he's a private citizen and he's not he's not hired or he doesn't work for the police department. I'm going to say no. OK. Am I, am I wrong? No, you're you're half right. That's half of the story. Okay. Um so I'll take half right. <laughs> so just for listeners who, you know, don't because I wouldn't have known what entrapment was technically until I really worked in the field. Entrapment is a complete defense to a criminal charge on the theory that government agents may not originate a criminal design, implant in an innocent person's mind the disposition to commit a criminal act and induce the commission of the crime. Okay, so that's the other half of it then, because they he's not putting it in people's mind. Yeah, so it's really the government inducement mm -hmm. and the defendant's lack of predisposition to engage in the criminal c conduct. Right. So, for example, an undercover cop hanging out acting like a sex worker or a drug dealer can bust anyone who solicits them right. for drugs or sex. However, if the cop was aggressively saying, like, hey, you want to buy some drugs? Oh, what are you, a wimp? You don't want to, you know, come with me, whatever. Right. That's inciting someone. That's not okay. That's right? entrapment. So it's only entrapment when they do, when a government agent does something to overcome some resistance that you put up to committing the crime. So unless you can really show that they changed your mind, 
The mm-hmm. entrapment defense doesn't work. Mm-hmm. It usually requires coercion or some kind of overbearing tactics. I wonder what percentage of cases even involve. I mean, we know that only like three to five percent of cases go to trial. And then of those three to five, mm-hmm. I wonder what percent would even employ an entrapment defense. It's very rare. Yeah. So, Megan, the mere existence of a fake website that someone must search out does not qualify. Now, if you were sending out a mass email or cold calling people to offer them hitman services, mm-hmm. you know, perhaps that would qualify. And as you mentioned, Bob is just really a concerned citizen, right? Mm -hmm. I personally believe it would have to be someone in some official capacity doing the entrapment. Side note, the police know about this website. So that's where things to me get, you know, a little bit blurry. Because although he's just a citizen, he kind of works with the police. I mean, yes, I I doubt they pay him. You know, there's no, they definitely don't pay him. They don't pay him. And he's not an agent. He doesn't represent them. He's just he's providing them with information. I guess it's I guess it's the likes of calling a tip line. I I was just going to liken it to that. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you talk about entrapment in your intro class, but just yesterday when I was teaching intro, guess what we watched? How to Catch a Predator. Gosh. Because my students are always want to know, why is that not entrapment? Goodness, so for Chris those of Hansen, you, that show. So, and as I, to, as I tell my students, I laugh at that, not because of the subject material. No. There's nothing funny about what's going on. No. But that is pure entertainment. And Chris Hansen is comedy gold in that show. Mm-hmm. Right? So for those of you who don't know on How to Catch a Predator, it's like an undercover sting operation where people pose as underage decoys in chat rooms. Mm -hmm. And the reason this is not entrapment is because the chat room is intended for underage people. So the predator chooses to go to the chat room, Mm -hmm. A, and B, the predator is the first one to make contact with the what they believe is an underage girl, which Mm -hmm. is really a decoy. And the decoy doesn't work for law enforcement. But they, they kind of do, actually. And they oh, okay. do. Yeah, Sorry. so it's like an operation. It's like a sting operation. So they like hire the actors. So they do work. Oh, I see. They're not you an agent, though. They're not a government official. They're not a government official, but the actor is mm-hmm. working with the task force. So okay. it, it, again, it's like That's it. they, know, they know where that line is. And yeah. I mean, it's pretty tragic. That show has yielded you know, many people dying by suicide. And of course, there are there's many critics of that show. So I could spend a whole episode talking about that show and the ethics of it, but we won't. Oh, for sure. Okay. so the issue I have with the website is I think that the vast majority of people who would, I guess you could say, fall for something like this, fall for a site like this, are people that are likely to maybe have some combination of intellectual disability, Mm -hmm. impulsivity, you know, someone who's just maybe blowing off steam. Mm hmm not thinking clearly due to rage, right? So maybe they don't question how unrealistic the site is. Someone who's desperate, maybe for good reason, maybe someone who's being abused. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's important to point out that I don't think we're dealing with sociopaths or hardened criminals or people that really pose a high risk. I think that if we were dealing with people who were very high risk, I think these individuals would see through a ridiculous site would just attempt the murder themselves or solicit somewhere elsewhere that they trust. Hmm. So I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, do you think? I think they pose a high risk by the very nature of that they're trying to contract a hitman. Yeah, I guess you're right. I guess my point is that like. You don't think it's the most sophisticated yeah, that's or what I think. organized exactly. or well thought exactly. out planned. And that part I understand completely. I mean, is this. OK, we talked about I want to know, do you think this is entrapment? Is this in any way vigilanteism? Like, what do you think about this website and what's going on here? Well, by this, you know, by the definition, it's not entrapment, but of course, it feels like it. Um, like, does it feel icky to you, or is this okay? <laughs> oh, that's that's really a tough question, to be honest. Um, does it feel a little icky? Yeah, but it, does it also feel like maybe it saves some lives? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, do we allow the icky for the greater good? Yeah, I'm not sure what the answer is. Mm-hmm. Um, I think. The judge was right. Had it not been for the topic, this is comical. Mm -hmm. But it's not so funny when someone, you know, contracts uh, and has contracts an actual hitman and has someone killed. Yeah. And so I don't know. I don't know that I have a problem. I don't. I actually, I'll tell you this. I personally don't have a problem with it. Listen, I think you're right. I think the fact that it's definitely saved at least one life. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it's a it's a good thing. But I, I just wonder if there is a better way to do this. I don't know what the better way to intercept a request for a hitman would actually be. So I guess the police, <laughs> why wouldn't the police be able to have a website like this? Because then it would be entrapment. There Not are if someone's looking for it, though. But right? they're a government official. Oh, because they're the government official. So, yeah. 
I guess that's why. So in a, in a way, they're kind of the police are lucky because they're getting like some really good investigative work for free. That's probably <laughs> true. Yeah, they probably appreciate the tips. Yeah, and then definitely. they get to make the collars and. We're going to talk about her sentence, I assume. Yeah, when that was going to be my next question to you. Oh, okay. Do you think the sentence is appropriate? I mean, 7 to 20 is, you know, she'll probably, she already has time served. So figure that's almost two years served with getting out on parole. She can get out early. What do you think? A couple of years, she can get, easily get out, right? I think she can get out in four to five years. Yeah. So what do you think? Not appropriate. I could see your face. Yeah. I mean, I understand that she's sorry and I don't know, your intent on in other cases, when you intend or attempt to commit a murder, the punishment is much more severe. I think that's a little light for me. You do? Yeah, I think I'd want to see her in for 10 years. So you think maybe they should have done minimum 10 instead of minimum 7? I think so. Yeah, okay. I definitely think so. And then, But I, I don't want to see like early parole. I like the truth in sentencing 85%, yeah. so she serves 8.5. That yeah. would seem more appropriate to me. Yeah, I could see that. I, I think at least. I, I mean, I think this is really serious that she wanted to have I someone killed wait i'm sorry yeah what, yeah what okay. you didn't really say what you think is it your your um i think her sentence is fair okay. i'd like to see her i know she's going to end up serving only 85 percent probably so i'm kind of with you i think seeing her serve a decade would be better i mean if you look at her age she doesn't have any priors i don't think she is a danger to society no probably not so i don't think Having her serve a long sentence would be protecting society in any way. If anything, it's serving as a general deterrent. A general deterrent. I also, well, I'm a retributivist. So yeah, I like I punishment because it's For just. For the sake and it's of punishment, yeah. Well, because it's deserved, but yeah. I think proportionate too. Yes, but I don't think. In, I don't think incapacitation is right. served. You no. know, I don't think we need to keep the streets safe. Sometimes we want to impose a long sentence yeah. because this person's a danger to society. She's a woman who got caught in the shock and the very nature of getting uh, caught and punished. She'll, she certainly, I would bet she'll never commit another crime again. Yeah, I, I would agree. But I wonder if she would learn that lesson with just five years. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I wonder if she needs, is 10 years just because of the retribution? You want I to think see it reflects years. the severity of the crime. Yeah. I think 10 years reflects the severity. I don't think you should be allowed to hire a hitman and get, you know, out in a couple of years. I don't think you should attempt make a real legitimate attempt to have someone killed and we just give you a slap on the wrist, which is what a couple of years feels like to me. It also seems like it's going back to the idea of deterrence because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not okay to hire a hitman. And if we let her go with a slap on the wrist, it's sending the message mm -hmm. to all people who are considering hiring, hiring a hitman, like, oh, it's not so bad if I get caught. So differential reinforcement, differential Re reinforcement, people I mean, learn that they can hire hitmen. And you know, hey, if I get caught, well, it's just a couple of years. Yeah, exactly. So I think she might be being made an example out of a little bit, which I think might be okay. I think if she it saves lives. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I don't know that theories are relevant here other than any theories that can help us understand hitmen because they're, as we said, they're very understudied. But interesting, I know the Iceman has been studied, but he's a serial killer hitman, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from what I understand, hitmen, it's usually people that go into the business of being assassins Biz. or hitmen are usually, I would, I would assume they're in it for the financial gain. Yep. I don't believe Iceman. I think he was probably in it more because, like, if I recall Iceman... Of course, he wanted the money, mm -hmm. but there was a lot more to his murders. He was a profit killer, uh -huh. but he f said he enjoyed his work yep. and he was fine or enjoyed knowing that his face would be the last one that person would see. Yeah, And he would like what he I remember hearing an interview. He would like to watch the life drain from the eyes. Yeah, he and had a very violent upbringing, too. I don't know if you recall. Should, should social scientists be looking into more the phenomenon of people hiring hitmen or why people become hitmen? Is this of course, just it's just one of those areas that's really hard to tap into, yeah. right? I remember like I knew a researcher who wanted to study like illegal firearms trade and his colleagues had told him, you're never going to get anyone to talk to you. You know, he surprisingly did. You know, he was an ethnographer and someone who did field research, but this is a hard group to tap into. Maybe not that hard. Maybe the, you know, the hit, the classic hitman isn't that intelligent. I think they're probably you know, just financially motivated, and probably not the most organized, mm -hmm. probably not, you know, the most well-employed, we'll say. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's like a, a value system, but maybe, you know, there's a culture of violence that is acceptable, possibly. I'm really not sure. I couldn't tell you other than 
utilitarian profit, you know, why else someone, uh, you know, the only one I said I know again is Richard Kuklinski. And yeah. uh, he did it for profit, but also for personal enjoyment. Also, if you were to research these individuals, there would be a huge selection bias because you would only talk to people that have gotten caught. Right. Right. So, I mean, it's almost like, of course, we can learn from them. But the more interesting thing would be to find out why some people get caught and some don't. And right. that's not something I don't think. I don't think a hitman who hasn't got caught yet would want to talk to a researcher. <laughs> I don't think so either, Amy. <laughs> Megan, do you see any way to connect this to vigilantism? You know, I don't know if you get this, Megan. Sometimes I have friends and family text me like, you said this in an episode. What does that mean? You know, so <laughs> I Definitely. Think, you know, I keep that in mind. Um, vigilantism is when people take the law into their own hands. And while Bob is not actually committing any act, not for him, these people would not be brought to justice. So I kind of see it as a form of vigilantism. What do you think? No, I think it's a tip line. Yeah. yeah because I mean, he's, vigilantism implies that you have to be going outside the law, taking the law into your own hands. He's not. Yeah. He's turning them over to the law. So I think this is akin to, yeah, I think this is more akin to a tip. I don't see it as vigilante. Or like the guardian angels. I don't see this as vigilante justice. Okay, great. All but right. I got to tell you, yeah. I, I had no idea where you were going with this one. <laughs> I, I, I'm floored. I'm still like, you it saw me. My mouth was hanging open when you were reading some of this stuff. This is definitely one of the more interesting cases uh, you brought to us, Amy. Thank you. I hope uh, our listeners don't mind taking a break from all of the heavy content that we usually put out. But yeah, it was nice to switch things up a bit. And thank you so much for listening. But before we go, let's go to some of our supporter questions. Yes, we have quite a few today. We do. All right. So our first one is from Sarah. Okay. And Sarah wants to know, do you feel amongst your colleagues and associates that you work with in the justice system that the majority are overall pleased with the New York Domestic Violence Survivors Act, which gives judges the power for reduced alternative sentences? when someone is found guilty of a violent crime against their abuser? Or do you feel it is very much still thought of as vigilante justice? I can answer. I can tell you that I appreciate this new change. And I think the, can't, while I can't speak for everyone, the people that I've spoken with in our field also think that this is a very positive change and levels the playing field a little bit because in ways, you know, people who have been victims of abuse have been, you know, victimized through the system again. So I think this is a positive step. Although I want to note that we don't always see the policy playing out how it is intended to, because I don't think that it helped Nikki Adamondo, at least not yet. Well, it did help Nikki. She was originally sentenced to 19 years in prison and her sentence was reduced to five years. Now, we're not saying I'm not saying that that's totally appropriate, but it did help. It certainly got her a reduction in her sentence, I think. Yes, you're right. It's better than nothing. But I think I think justice so. has not been served yet in that case. OK, again, these are just opinions. The next question is from Michelle. And I know your answer, Megan. Michelle okay. wants to know, I am wondering if you have any favorite Canadian cases or upcoming Canadian cases. You know my answer? Carla Homolka? Of course. That was definitely one of my, that was my initial, one of my first ones, was, but I have a couple. I'm also interested in covering Rena Verk. She was a young 14-year-old girl who was um, the victim of you know, a heinous attack by like six other females and a male, you know, kind of one of those kind of one of those cases that I've covered before, like group mob mentality, but among teenagers and they severely beat her and murdered her. And the motivations are still a little bit unclear to me. So I'd like to dive into that one. I'm also really interested, even though it's not necessarily women in crime, there are female victims, but I've been very interested in the serial offending of Colonel Russell Williams who was a very decorated, I believe it was Air Force captain in Canada, who was also a serial murderer. And he killed women that he knew, which is very much outside what we usually know about male perpetrators in that regard. So those are some of the cases that I'm interested in. Um, the only case that comes to mind, I have a couple of Canadian cases on my list, but I'm really interested in the Maria Shepard case. Uh, Maria Shepard was charged with the death of her three and a half year old stepdaughter. And this was one of those cases where there was a forensic pathologist who claimed that the child died as a result of abuse. But mm -hmm. then, in you know, when we get to the appeals level, you see some of the junk science emerge. So it's a really interesting case. All right. The next question, I think we're going to go through a, a little bit quicker because I think we've been asked this question before. But Lisa wants to know what made you both go into the field of criminology 
Mm-hmm. And she says, so many of us would like to, but few women actually do. And I am wondering why. Is it because it's a male-dominated field or cultural issues? Um, I actually think that there's a lot more females than there used to be. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the statistics are to tell you the truth, but just anecdotally, I don't see there being a discrepancy as much as there used to be. But for no, me, the not. field. Of, yeah, for me, I went in. You know, very quickly, I went into the field because I was interested in helping people um, who don't have a voice. And when you look at our criminal justice system, for me, that was where I saw a lot of our you know issues in society stemming from. I just loved criminal justice and I never thought about the gender role at all. And I never let that, you know, kind of prohibit me in any way. Um, I can tell you, Amy, statistically, women are equal with men in the field when it comes to law. So practicing attorneys, women are very close, but not quite equal, but still much closer when it comes to working in corrections, where we're still um, not as close as in policing. So that would be probably about 15 to 20 percent of officers are women, but we're getting there. I certainly loved working as a probation officer. And, and instead of feeling that I didn't feel that I was blocked or I didn't feel that there was anything hindering me, rather, I felt that my qualities as a female complimented some of the male officers and ha- helped us work together really well. Okay, so this is a super interesting question from Adriana and one that would make for a great discussion at one of our Zoom happy hours. But what okay. she's asking is she's saying, given what we know about the overall risk factors of offenders, do you think minors who were born or lived through the ongoing pandemic will require supportive interventions? And should those be holistic in approach and practice or individualized to address traumatizing experiences? I think it'll be interesting to see what the lasting effects are of the pandemic. I think it is too soon to tell what kind of services people will need to deal with the trauma they experience during the pandemic. But when we talk about addressing trauma generally, I think an individualized Treatment plan is always the better way to go. But unfortunately, that costs time and money. I just don't think we have the resources to approach every situation as an individualized one. I would have to agree. It is a little too soon to tell, but good question. Thank you. Okay. Lastly, Cass wants to know, how large of a role do you think neurobiology plays in violent offending? Neurobiology is an area that we focus on, biology, and you combine that with sociology and you can explain probably a great amount of violent offending. So while we typically look to sociological factors, we know so much more now scientifically that definitely shows there is a strong role of um, neurobiology and the neurological factors that affect people, especially now what we know with brain injuries. And I can even tell you, like, as it pertains to when I teach serial offenders, almost all serial offenders or serial killers are suffering from neuropsychological deficits. And almost all criminal career offenders, maybe too much strong to say almost all, but a vast majority of career criminal offenders also suffer from these deficits. So I would say a a pretty strong role. And it's also not known how many of those individuals had a pre-existing neurological deficit. So couple that with an injury, and I think that is where we see such a problem. Correct, yeah. As always, we appreciate your questions and look forward to more of them. Thanks so much for listening today, and we will catch you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer is James Varga, edited by Jose Alfonso. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show through Patreon, where you can get access to additional ad-free content such as virtual happy hours and an extra full-length episode each month. For more information, visit patreon.com slash women in crime. Sources for today include Rolling Stone, CNN, The Guardian, Crawl Space, Law and Crime, SFGate.com, New York Post, Daily Mail, and Vice. Mail and Vice. Mail and Vice. Mail and Vice.